The Sign Institute of Policy and Politics is American University's incubator for policy innovation. We convene leaders in the academic, public, private, nonprofit, and journalism sectors to engage and promote common ground and nonpartisan solutions. In an evolving world, we seize the opportunity to work on the nation's most pressing challenges through collaboration by experts and top scholars in their field with students in research and scholarship. As part of that goal, the Sign Institute leverages American University's location in our nation's capital, the nexus of government and a growing international business center. We connect diverse perspectives from around the country and around the world with our world-class academics and research, experienced practitioners, and the most politically active student body in the U.S. We stand apart through our focus on the role of business and the nonprofit community in public policy, the rise of the importance of economic regions in the United States, and international policy issues. Our focus is to make an immediate impact at the intersection of policy and politics that leads to real and lasting change. Thank you for joining us as we convene, communicate, and collaborate. And now, Sign Institute 2023 fellow, Anna Devere Smith. Anna, welcome back. Um, your third session. We were we're excited to get um, talking about this, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor today to be in conversation with Anna Devere Smith, playwright, actress, teacher, author. I don't even know if that's the 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 um, lineup or how you do it. If you identify with more, but there's so many different things that you do to communicate. It's it's incredible and. We've really enjoyed the experience with you coming to campus and then sharing sometimes virtually the topic of creating communities of goodwill. And we've had you speak collectively with other fellows to start off with in your cohort and then a virtual conversation with a group where you discuss goodwill and set the conversation around the topic. And then I was um, able to join that incredible in-person uh, we're uh, and able to participate in, in really went to the differences between listening and hearing and communicating, which is at really at the heart of some of these issues that we have. And so for those who weren't able to be a part of those, they are available on the Sign Institute YouTube, and I encourage you to really take advantage of the content and view them there. Um, so that leads us here today. Um, I am going to encourage everybody to ask questions as we go. I, Anna and I agree. We don't like waiting till the end to have questions. If there's a question that's going with the conversation or you want to bring um, together, please do so. Um, raise your hand. We'll try and pull you in and make sure the technology lets us you know, do that. But we want you to be a part of the conversation. Um, and I think that we can ask some questions that will probe a little deeper into some of the subjects that we've covered and, of course, open it up, as I said, to questions as we go. But you know, it's interesting. I think you heard in the video, Anna, here at, at the Sign Institute, we try to convene, communicate, and collaborate. Like those are some of the tenets of all the events that we do or some of the conversations we bring. And you have said that your writing work in many cases improved when you collaborated. So is collaboration essential for goodwill? And what are the benefits? I think you recently you've done some collaborations too. How important is it? Well, you know, I think... Um... You know, even if we think about the, let me say, first of all, but the, how much I've been, I've enjoyed my time uh, at uh, the Sign Institute. And in particular, last week when uh, uh, a class from across the hall kind of, <laughs> they just said, what's going on over they there? What's we had going a whole on classroom. over there? And they came over and, and joined, which I think is uh, right there. That's goodwill. I mean, we didn't say, no, you can't come. Yeah. Uh, we welcome them. And so hospitality is, is a part of goodwill, as is being a good guest. And I think and they were fantastic guests. And so I think right there, um, we have a part of what goodwill is. And, and part of that had to do with that professor, right? Who just came on over, uh, gave up whatever he was planning to do that day to participate. So I think, you know, one very, very important and obvious element to goodwill is a willingness to participate. And the other thing um, I would say about the time we had last week in that group is I sent everybody out to work in in, in smaller groups is, um, you know, that was an experience of collaboration. Everybody in those groups had to come back into the room with a product, right? So right then and there, anybody who's on this uh, particular webinar will remember what that experience was to collaborate and with strangers because sometimes, because I just had people count off in numbers. And I have to say that way back when I was training um, in the conservatory, that was something that was a relief to me that, mm -hmm. 
you know, as most groups of people kind of make their own selection groups and uh, make their own cliques, I was relieved that a lot of what we did uh, in that environment was just count off and get into groups of random people, right? So that you, therefore you break that up. So I think that's another element, right? Is the randomness of groupings that break up the ways that we organize ourselves. And sometimes those are good ways and sometimes those are not great ways, right? Right. right. Uh, one very bad way right now that may be something that uh, the undergraduates would remember from high school and middle school is the identification of a, a you know a bully against one person right who can, who makes a conglomeration of folks against that so to me just first of all the the uh, the surprise of being with people that you didn't select to be with. Then I want to say a little bit about my most recent collaboration that I also think um, is a good sort of metaphor for goodwill, which is that I uh, wrote an opera, the libretto for an opera, Renee Fleming, uh, the great uh, soprano asked me to do so and to do it about gun violence among youth in Chicago, uh, based on having seen my play notes from the field about the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that I had to do was to find a community where I could safely interview people who were involved in gun violence. And I thought of Arne Duncan, the former secretary of education, uh, who had, after he left the White House, co-founded with Lorraine Powell Jobs, uh, an organization called Chicago Cred. And uh, Arnie's idea was to uh, let's attack gun violence by working with the shooters. In other words, you know, projects like early childhood, early, that's fine, but are we going to give up on the people who actually are the shooters, people who shot somebody, young people who shot somebody, ended up in prison, came out. And so this uh, organization, Chicago Cred, uh, also, as he says, is um, you can't do this work from downtown. And um, so so that so so here's this community of people who, number one, speaking of hospitality, allowed me access. That's one thing to think about is as I try to make a community of goodwill, who am I giving access to? And are all those people just like me? I'm completely different from the individuals who, as youth, were involved in gang violence. And yet they welcomed me. And not only did they welcome me, they helped me make my way around that community. They introduced me to people. So what is your generosity about not just yourself, but how do you bring people along to be emblematic of what generosity is? That's another element. And so that, then let, that's, my, that's where I did my research. Let me cut to the collaborators that I dealt with. Right. Uh, first of all, the Opera House, the Lyric Opera of Chicago is a grand place uh, that seats 6,000 people. For the head, six thousand. Wow. For the head of that opera, Anthony Freud, to get behind this project, what's the likelihood that people who fill those six thousand seats are people who've ever seen an opera about gun violence among gangs in Chicago? Very unlikely, right? right. So he too is taking the risk. Risk is another part of creating communities of goodwill to open the door. He then assigned two people to me who were a part of helping that research process. Now let's look at the creative collaborators. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, uh, the director was Yuval Sharon, who by, was called by the New York Times, opera's new disruptor. The disruptor. Oh, I like that, yeah, that's so good. Disruption, somebody who like Yuval is very brilliant, uh, he runs the Detroit Opera right now, but he's he's a worldwide um, respected young. He's only 42. Oh, wow. OK. I think youth is useful, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, individual and a composer, Daniel uh, Bernard Romain, who is a, uh, 
young, uh, fairly young um, uh, Haitian American composer. So we're a diverse group. Yuval's parents were Israeli. They left Israel so that their children wouldn't have to uh, join the army. Uh, Daniel's folks are from, um, uh, from Haiti. I'm from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But what did we have in common? What we had in common was a love of taking risks in a creative environment. Yeah. Very important. We did not always agree. And we didn't know each other and we had to meet each other on Zoom. And uh, we all had very strong ideas. However, Yuval had an ingredient that's really important in creating a community of goodwill. He always worked towards some kind of consensus. And he himself was willing to walk the distance. I'll give you an example. When I first turned into libretto, uh, uh, Daniel, you know, you know, sort of really just chopped it up. And I said to Yuval, uh, even if I write for the New York Times, so I get all puffed up. Even if I write for the New York Times, they don't just make cuts and not discuss it with me, right? So we could have all been puffed up. Yeah. Yuval came to New York, <laughs> sat, down, minds all, yeah. sat down with me and said, I don't really agree with this, but in opera, the composer has the last say. Interesting. Right? Yeah. No, he doesn't. The composer has the last say. He came and sat down and said, I don't really agree with this, but the composer has the last say. Right? So it's who's the person in your midst who's going to, in a very gracious way, set the rules right 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 yeah. um, and you know in the end i think all three of us uh, if you were to talk to yuval and and we you know yuval and and daniel that you know they would agree that this was a very dynamic collaboration and a lot of it did have to do with disagreement but ultimately and this is an ingredient we don't talk about so much in the united states particularly in educational environments um, we loved each other. Mm. And you can't prescribe that. But we came to love each other in particular because of the ways that we were able to deal with disagreement. It's, you say love, but is there also trust involved? Because do, do you have to trust the environment so that you can ask questions or challenge? Or, I mean, I think well, a lot I, of times people are worried about Having I, I don't, I don't, you know, what I say when people say, do you trust me? You know, which I've been in another collaboration where somebody called me up and said, do you trust me? I don't think that way because I don't think that trust is a given. I think trust is earned. Mm -hmm. And I think we throw that word around. And so part of it is we can't even have disagreement because it's like, well, if you don't trust me, we can't work together. Trust is earned. And it's earned, in fact, by putting yourself as the group to the test about things like, can you endure disagreement? Mm. And, you know, one of the things that's come up uh, at this with this work I've been able to do with you all at the Sign Institute is, and I know you're going to get to this probably, Amy, is the fear of saying something that is unpopular. Yes. But if we don't say it, and if we don't have disagreement, we cannot build trust. So all we do is walk around with blinders on and hope nothing bad happens. We can't proceed that way. And that's why I wanted to come to your community of people who are going to be leaders, yeah. to see what they're thinking about how we'll do this. And the last thing I wanna say about me, Daniel, and um, Yuval is we were three different, we were decades apart in age. And so that there was a cross-generational thing going on. And I think that's also right now really important. And by the way, they didn't give me, um, uh, they, they, they were respectful, but I didn't get extra votes because I was the oldest. 
So th that collaboration has to be, there's respect amongst everyone, but just because there's a, you've done something longer doesn't mean that your perspective is like, like you have to, true collaboration is coming in as equals. And, in some of and, and almost, it's great that we all three did different things, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, it, it, this was Daniel's first opera, was my first opera. I don't know anything about <laughs> music for opera. And Yuval is, you know, been a director. I mean, so it's also useful if you can appreciate that what are other people bringing to this mix? It's different than what you do. Well, and I think you, you mentioned coming in this community and why it's important to go to this, this setting is that I think a lot of times in our younger lives, we're, we're kind of in these silos. And I, and I think that's some of the breakdown and we don't see collaboration because, you know, we can exist in these silos. And if we don't get different perspectives or go to different places, I, I think your work, and, and it's interesting, especially the opera, I'm assuming that the arts can help you break down silos. If you're always thinking about something, you're getting your information from one place, it can help you kind of get a different perspective. Well, I mean, but you have to be very intentional about those silos. So I want to give you another example, which is that one of the stories in the opera is about a woman who was driving down the street uh, with her toddler in the back to go to the laundromat. And um, Yasmeen Miller is her name and her toddler was named Sincere. Uh, and someone so it randomly started shooting in the in, at the car, and the child was killed, and uh, the mother herself was uh, wounded, and she rushed to the hospital, and they were working on her with her to how what how's my baby how's my baby and they mm -hmm. told her as she said right then and there he didn't make it, Ooh. and it's some of the most beautiful music that. Uh, Daniel wrote for that part of the opera. Um, and uh, I want to say that one of the things that we have working for us in art is that we can use beauty to engage people, even with things that are very difficult to look at. To look at. Uh, so that, for example, it would be hard to watch the news, maybe, about that. But because the music was so beautiful, people were absolutely riveted to that story as it was sung. Um, and the organization Chicago Cred knew that that story was in the opera. And so they came two times before dress rehearsal and everybody was, they were all invited to dress rehearsal. It, it, individuals from the leadership came twice, somebody from counseling and somebody who's like a religious figure came twice to watch the opera first mm -hmm. to think of how they would prepare the real woman, Yasmin Miller, to see it. And that was really powerful to me because the death of Sincere had been a, a very uh, difficult for every single person involved in that community, that that toddler was killed. And um, ultimately, Yasmin Miller did come with her husband, the father of the child, Thomas, uh, to opening night. And at, the, at the, the end of the evening, she wrote to Arnie Duncan and said, they kept my baby's name alive. That that's unbelievable. I mean, what that? So you see where I'm talking about? We all you use the word trust, and Arnie has said publicly in, in Jonathan Capehart's show in Washington that he trusted me. But I I think it it's not a it's not a blind trust. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah. And that Absolutely. we came we came to trust each other. That is very active. What you have to do, but it's more satisfying when you're reaching beyond. Yeah, I mean, none of none of the people in Chicago cred, including Arnie Duncan, had ever been to opera before. Had never even been. So here we are, going to no. tell a story, a conversation yeah. through right. opera, and hadn't been. That's amazing. And all the singers went over to one of the Chicago Cred headquarters. They'd never oh. been anywhere like that. So we also now have to really walk the distance. Got it. Listen, I, I've got Peyton here. Peyton, if you can unmute, I know you had a question that was kind of in relation to, to, to what we were just talking, Anna and I. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> excuse me, uh, earlier you were talking about taking risks and how that's a very important part of creative decisions and collaborating with people. And you experienced ta people taking risks on you and you taking risks with them. But I'm curious how you weigh those pros and cons to decide when a risk is worth taking and when to hold off. Well, I, I think you, you know, you sort of get signs about that 
as you move along. I mean, it's kind of like if you are, what would be a good example? Uh, you know, you decide you want to climb a certain mountain. Uh, you know, maybe you don't do it all in one day. You, you want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, you don't do it all in one day. First of all, you, you learn how you have to train for that altitude. You get yourself ready um, physically. And so part of risk taking has to do with having failed in the past to know how far you can go um, and then building strength and going again. So it isn't, it's like trust. It's not something you just jump up and take a risk, right? I mean, I had a lot of experience, for example, of working in communities of violence and trauma. Uh, a lot of my work had dealt with that and death before I showed up uh, asking to interview people at Chicago Cred. Thank you, Peyton. I appreciate you bringing that up. I, I, I want to go back for a minute because one of the things we did get kind of tactical in, when, in the in-person session about listening and um, in our listening for the rhythm in which a person speaks. Do you think that with the division in this country and it is driven by our inability to listen and what needs to happen to change that? Because it's hard to collaborate when people aren't listening to each other too. And you say, I, I think of specific examples of Capitol Hill and, you know, sometimes in public service, like. Well, I think that, um, you know, look, not everybody's going to do it. And that's why you have schools like American University training diplomats. I happen to be right now calling through of all things, the constitution of 1864 uh, of Maryland, which was specifically the constitutional debates of the constitutional convention specifically brought together to deal with slavery because Maryland, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation actually had no effect in Maryland because Maryland was not a part of the Confederacy, it was part of the Union, although there were slaveholders. So whereas the Emancipation Proclamation freed slaves in 1863, in Maryland, here they are still enslaved. And so the you can this debate, I'm reading this stuff from 1864, the debate is so heated, right? And right. part of it, I feel, is almost like people standing up and just trying to chisel other people down with these very long-winded arguments. So, you know, I, I think it, it's about who actually has the talent and the skill set to try to open that up. And when you're young, if you're interested in that. Yeah. And not everybody is. Clearly in our country, very few people are. You can hone those skills. So what I would recommend is that for this generation in places like American University, places like Georgetown University, that you find the people who are even willing yeah. to do the listening, willing not to belong to a faction and give them the training that they need to do it. And it goes back to Peyton's question about risk mm -hmm. to build those muscles. And, you know, why I wanted to bring this idea to you is because if they're not rehearsing it in places like American University, we're in big trouble. Yeah. And, and I think in some respects, like you mentioned, you, the, your recent collaboration was generational, right? So it is important that, you know, there might be challenges with what's happening, you know, in government today, but these young voices have to work with us to figure out what's the next step. They um, are embodying the next step. I mean, you yeah. know, I remember when I interviewed Madeleine Albright, her talking about, you know, um, you know, at Georgetown, you know, talking about her diplomatic toolbox. And right. so, you know, if, if we don't do this and, you know, look, NYU, we're teaching artists, you know, that, that it's not, there's an, other issues there. But, you know, if you, if, you know, when I talked to the dancers at the Alvin Ailey Dance Company, all the girls had started dancing when they were three. Yeah. The, the boys could jump on when they're 18, 19. They could have been football players. But there's certain muscles you have to have time to develop. And it seems to me that universities need to embrace the laboratory possibility that they are. We mm -hmm. cannot market process. And universities are one of the few places that we can really investigate process, trial and error. Here's an interesting question that came in early on our, our email for somebody who couldn't join us today. But Elise was asking, 
is it, and this is something I deal with it. Is it okay to get emotional in your conversations or in your work? You know, are, are emotions a sign of weakness? Like I, I have to say, sometimes I, I can get emotional, especially when you're in those dialogues in those, is it okay to get emotional? I mean, well, look, I, the, the, the art form that I'm in is all about emotions. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, what, what's expected in the, in the realm of government and diplomacy is presence of mind. Mm. That doesn't mean you're not emotional. Right. But you do have to, again, it's about practice. You don't just jump up one day yeah. and have the power to communicate. Mm -hmm. You just don't. So to me, it's about practicing around the things about which I have great emotion to see if it, if I can also have presence of mind. Yeah, it's important. Okay, so one of the things- And by the way, what's yes. less important than your emotions um, is that you evoke emotions in others. In others, okay. That's a good so point. You, it, it's almost better to learn presence of mind mm -hmm. so that you can hold your emotions and others, whether they like it or not, will feel them and become emotional, if that makes sense to you, right? Yeah, it does make sense, a lot of sense. If I, I get up on stage and I'm just emotional, like say if I were to pre perform a Yasmin Miller, like the singer did, and she was, that singer was very emotional about that material. We lost one singer who couldn't deal with the emotions, but she has the skill sets to sing the notes. Right? So it's not emotion for its own sake. If you know you care about something and you're going to get emotional about it, then it's to learn to have enough skill in presence of mind or communication to have the two balance. That makes total sense. I, I think one of the other things that was really kind of a, I know an aha moment for me, and you could see it some other spaces when you said it, but when you spent time with us on campus recently, you posed the question, what does it cost you to process something you don't agree with? And I could see that moment where people are like, yeah, what, you know, and it's, they're trying to think through what does it, you know, cost you, does it? And, and so you can do that. But is there ever a situation where the cost is too much? You know, you talk about some um, of the artists that you work with, the, the, you know, working with issues that are, are very complicated and trauma and, you know, is it ever too much to kind of do that? Well, I think it's almost like two questions. I think the question of, what does it cost you? I can't answer. You know, I posed mm -hmm. that question as a, yeah. a, a, as a provocateur. For, I, I'm asking everyone to think about that. Mm -hmm. what, what does it really cost you to process something that you don't agree with? What does it cost you to sit with something that you don't agree with, right? I mean, in my case, as a metaphor only, as an actor, um, I hold many uh, ideas uh, that I don't agree with in terms of performance. But again, I also have to know the lines, right? I'm speaking as someone else, right? So it's about paying attention. So I don't know the answer to what does it cost you to process, to sit with the process. But I do know, mm -hmm. I feel very clear that that's exactly what people who are going to help make a difference in this country need to practice. You know, what does that cost you to sit with it? It doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but process it. What is this person? What is their intention? What are they saying? And by the way, it, it's also the way to, in the end, to have your, have your, your philosophy reign, right? Because it's only going <laughs> yeah. to strengthen you to really understand the argument that the other person is bringing. It's only going to strengthen your argument. So that's one part. You know, the other part about, um, you know, trauma is something that concerns me for us in the arts, yes, which is bad right now. And, you know, I think what kickstarted it is a good thing, which is um, the Me Too movement. Uh, because of that, then, for example, we have intimacy coaches. We don't assume that everybody's okay with certain stuff they have to do. But it also went further in terms of if you're working on a script, for example, I have a script about Ella Fitzgerald where 
um, you know, the N word is used and, you know, Ella lived in a time which is different than now in segregation. So we brought in somebody to prepare everybody for their feelings about that. Now, I'm, I'm a fuddy-duddy on this one because I feel that our job as artists is to be able to hold and speak for and represent. And so that's an area that I feel needs real attention in, in my art form is, are we going to be able to take that on anymore as our responsibility to carry both the tragic and the comic? Are we going to be able to do that? And, and, and whatever is going on right now, we have to take very seriously in terms of, are we going to be able to be the people who supposedly shed light on humanity if the stories are too hard for us to carry? And if so, maybe we're at a time of, of a greater kind of sensitivity. If so, what are the new sorts of skills that we need to develop to be able to hold these stories? And we certainly hope that you know surgeons can still look at disease, uh, we certainly hope that psychiatrists and therapists can hold stories, right? So it's not that this stuff is going to go away. It could be that it's bigger than it used to be. Then we need new skills. Well, it's interesting too to me, I, and and we're going to do this in our next newsletters, list them all and the availability. But I, of course, like I dove into a lot of what you've written, the the plays, the the books. One of them, um, Fires in the Mirror, was one of my favorites. And I think when you talk about that, can you delve into these things? Can you, what's it like when you are suddenly the voice of a, a character or a person that you'd interviewed? Like, do you, do you, how do you process that? And, and how important is it to bring their voice into the conversation, you know, in an authentic way when you're doing that kind of work specifically? Um, well, I, I want to just tell you that anecdotally something happened that shocked me as I got a award um, from a women's theater group here in New York. Mm -hmm. And they wrote to me and they said, um, you know, we'd like to ask Al Sharpton, who's one of the quote unquote characters in Fires in the Mirror, to yeah. introduce you, would that be okay? I said, he's not gonna do that. And much to my shock, he did. Yeah, he did. So he introduced yeah. you. He came to this event with all these women. <laughs> he introduced me. So, I don't know how many playwrights have characters you introduce them. You introduce them. It's a unique scenario. Yeah. It's kind of a unique scenario. And so, you know, in writing Fires in the Mirror, uh, what I wanted to do was to really show what a, a Rorschach test we have to be, exactly what you and I are talking about today, Amy, which is um, nobody agreed in that community about what had happened in the death of a young boy named Gavin Cato. Um, that, you know, uh, the Jews said that it was an accident, the Blacks said it was a murder. And um, I could go from one side of the street to the other and hear a completely different story. Uh, and so that was, you know, interesting to me to pursue, not just as a story about Crown Heights, but a story about what we're very, we're talking about right now is what happens when nobody agrees. And yeah. to sort of emblemize by the fact that I took on these different opinions that it is possible to do so if you if you are interested to do so. Yeah, I, I found the work really interesting too because to your point, everybody had different stories, but you presented that as as a work, bringing them all in, you know, about this this area. So we'll definitely share that. I I'd like to bring Caleb in. Caleb has a question. Can somebody unmute Caleb so he can ask his, please? There he is. Hi, Caleb. Hey there. Hi there. I think you're breaking up a little, Caleb. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I just wanted to thank you for being here um, and taking the time today to talk with us. But I was wondering, you know, as a popular artist, really all the things you do and um, work on are kind of under the public eye, especially like bigger projects and TV shows that you've been on. Um, so I was just wondering, um, with that amount of pressure, how do you handle that and manage to take care of yourself, but also stay true to your work and what you do and what you value? Right. Well, you know, I don't, I very, uh, what, what should we say? I infrequently appear uh, in media that um, is really widespread. 
you know, uh, television and movies infrequently. So I don't have the type of pressure that people who do that a lot have. And of course, everybody's different. My dear friend, Martin Sheen, um, who was on the West Wing, we were on the West Wing together, at the height of the West Wing, when his, what, he and his wife would come to New York, much to her horror, Janet Sheen, he would love to go on the subway and just like plunge into the people. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes and, the president. <laughs> I can't right, just plunge into the people in New York. You know, they can't, there's no place to do that really in LA. You know, you know, it's more polite. You drive around, make people recognize you at the grocery store or, but I mean, to plunge into the subway, he loved that. Um, of course, the subway was not as dangerous as it is now either. Um, so I don't have that. I mean, I think the pressure for me is about, um, you know, trying to deliver on projects and um, also I'm not risk averse. And so this year I've been working in forms that are new to me. Uh, and so I think that's really the pressure is meeting deadlines <laughs> for one thing. Um, you know, uh, I'm traveling again. I was just in Amarillo, Texas, where uh, if you go to Amarillo, Texas, there are there were 70 mile an hour winds. So I could not get for the restaurant back to my hotel. It was two blocks away and I had to chicken out and get an Uber to take me two blocks, walking in 70 mile winds. So, you know, I think there's a certain degree of adaptability that I have had to develop over years. And I think, you know, uh, COVID made me rusty. <laughs> so there's that. It's interesting. I was gonna ask as a follow-up, how, does somebody who is a storyteller and works on these things, how did COVID affect not only you and your individual ability to do that, but how do you think it affected the community and its ability to do some of this, this work? Um, it, it certainly as an industry, you know, I, I think there was challenges you see, you know, venues set shut down, you know, that kind of thing, but creative artists, how did they navigate this, this way? And was, and do some of these challenging moments help, you know, you didn't wish for them, but do they find different um, mediums or, or ways to, to rethink things? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, um, I wonder, I don't know enough to know if there is like an art form that has developed because of COVID, right? Uh, the ways people tried plays on COVID, I don't know. I mean, I think for the people who work alone, um, like composers or, or visual artists, it's a different matter. Uh, for me, it was an opportunity to really dedicate myself to writing in other forms uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, um, it was sort of a gift in that way. Uh, in other ways, it wasn't a gift. Um, I was on a television show that uh, COVID hit right while we were shooting. Um, it was a Shondaland show. And to their credit, they paid us all for all of the episodes. So that was sort of very generous on their part. I mean, I think the first thing everybody was afraid of was money, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sure. you know, we were able to pick back up and go again. But as we all know, I mean, look, the opening night of the opera, our one of our main singers um, was sick, uh, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that haunt, that continues to haunt all of the performing arts. This is a good follow-up question um, to my colleagues. Do you mind bringing in Sarah? Sarah has like a follow-up, you know, question, and it has to do with with COVID and, and communication. I think it's important. There she is, Sarah. Could you ask? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much for your time, Ms. Devere Smith. So I was just thinking back over the past few years, and most of my community interactions have been virtual, just over Zoom. So I was wondering if you had any recommendations for best practices, for encouraging, or maybe even ensuring goodwill when you're in a digital first community. Yeah, I don't, that's such a great question. I don't know the answer to it. You know, I actually, uh, I had to teach one semester on Zoom and I liked it um, because I felt there was a kind of greater intimacy. Uh, also because my students were like performing in their homes. So somebody wanted to set a performance in a bathtub, which she wouldn't have been able to do uh, in, you know, in water, <laughs> which she wouldn't have been able to do in our studio. Um, I think that's such a great question. I, 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 I said, you know, I really uh, encourage you to pursue it. I don't know the answer to it. 
No, I'm writing that one down because I think it's something to look into. And uh, Sarah, we'll we'll loop back with you and see if great. I mean, if I could follow up a little, I mean, one of the groups sure. that I volunteered with, we actually saw greater inclusivity because of the pandemic, because more folks who maybe had mobility issues or health concerns, you know, they were able to participate um, because we had access to Zoom. And so um, you know, you saw more people over Zoom than you would in person. However, I've noticed sometimes the the loss of that in-person connection you you learn more you have more spontaneity it seems with the in-person connections so I, I've been I've been struggling with it myself and I've been grappling with you know what is what are the best practices what where do we move forward as more things continue to open up and how do you create that system of care in all formats yeah well hopefully we learn from it I mean you know, Amy, it's a good question for you too. I mean, this, uh, the whole sign fellowship you've done using Zoom. So there's mm -hmm. probably some pluses and minuses. Number one, uh, there's less costs, there's a lot less travel uh, uh, costs and so forth and uh, hospitality costs this way, but there's downsides. Like me, I'd much rather, as you know, because I'm a process person, I'd much rather be in a room uh, with people to do what I do. But what, 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 what do you think in terms of just, the sign fellows. Well, you know, we did, we had our very first class that I worked with, they were basically in person for a month and then every, that's when everything shut down. And so I, I think for them, they had a very unique experience because they had developed some relationships already. So they were moving from an in-person to a virtual. So the virtuals seemed more of that collaboration because people had already met them and, you know, we were moving along. For the, the individuals that did, you know, just solely, um, it's interesting because to your point too, Sarah, for some people, some students who are more introverted, you know, this was an opportunity for them to feel a little bit more like more they had space to ask questions or to be a part of something. Um, but what students really want is if you're bringing these incredible practitioners who have so much to offer, for me, some of the best conversations are the ones that everybody stays a few minutes and they're, they're talking to each other or, you know, to your point, it's harder to have a two-way conversation and we do the best we can in this virtual kind of reality, but to see the engagement, you know, we like the, the in-person. I think the big question too, uh, maybe to your point, Sarah, is we're more in a hybrid environment. So how do you make that work so that, you know, people can benefit from that? But I think the in-person is, is just so beneficial from, you know, a collaboration standpoint. Um, and also just feeling the mass. I mean, for me, uh, um, when I was there last time, just to feel the mass of the people, yeah, right, and to see people looking at each other, and really to see all these different kind of bodies assembled, um, you know, is very inspiring to me. Yeah, I think so. And and you know, for me, the individual, the in person one that you did, just even the ability for students to go off in a small group and talk to each other you know, that's just different than, you know, online and that ability to quickly meet each other and talk through something and problem solve and, you know, have to report back. That alone got to the the heart of what you were discussing. Like you have to put yourself in situations where you're talking to people that are outside of those silos, understanding, doing the listening and actually, you know, going through. So I, I think in a way that also, um, and thank you, Sarah, it's something we're going to, you know, keep talking about. And I think that it's an important, you know, um, in, in this as I don't know if I like the two new normal, but you know, as we're kind of moving into this space, we've got to ask those questions. But I'd like to also bring in Anna Tyler because he has a question specifically. I know we're kind of moving into a COVID conversation, but he has a question specifically about artists and how they were able to operate. So Tyler, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Yes, hi to both of you. So my question is how did the COVID pandemic affect meeting and creating community with other artists when you couldn't be in a room, when you couldn't be in a theater with hundreds of uh, theater watchers, and how did COVID change the way that artists got their story across? Right, well, no, there's that, Tyler, of, uh, you know, we couldn't be in a room, but then when we were in a room or when we are in a room, uh, we're masked. So wow. even this whole procedure with the opera, there were people whose faces, because they're very strict about being masked, right? Because, and, and so they weren't taking off their masks, even in rehearsal, they weren't taking off their masks until they were on stage. So some of them, I never saw their whole face 
until they were actually up there on stage on in in on the one they it's not like theater where we have previews i mean they have like one dress rehearsal it's the first time i saw people's faces um and so i found it very difficult in uh the 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 rehearsal set i was in for the theater that people could not take their mask off i felt and i gave a had some performance workshops with girls and Baltimore at my old high school in the summer and also with an Indian tribe last summer. And just that you, you've got this obstacle to, I like to see a whole face and how it's expressive. You have this obstacle of, and of people who don't project, you can't hear what they're saying and so forth. And, you know, um, the people who do uh, vocal work always are pushing the lighting designers in theaters, for example, to say, if people can't see the lips of who's talking, they think they can't hear, right? So there are all these things that a face does uh, that are missing and, and annoying, really, in, in rehearsal. Um, thanks so much, Tyler. Uh, I have a question because it's something that we're trying to look at here at the Science Institute, Anna, which is in this public policy making process, literally all sectors ha do have influence and should have an influence. You know, I, I think the public sector is the obvious, like government makes decisions on the issues of the day, but whether or not the business community weighs in, nonprofits, um, you know, journalism and their role. But, you know, I, I have to ask the the opera that you're referring to, and I, it's called The Walkers, correct? Yeah. That's, that's, um, it discussed gun violence and gangs in Chicago. And so there's so many examples in your work and we'll share, you know, the books that you, you've written, the plays that you, you've done, but that really take the issues of the day and social justice issues in your artistic work. And so I'm curious, do you think that the arts are responsible in some way to inform us about important issues? You know, or is it these issues serve to entertain too? What is what is the role to kind of yeah, bring I mean, these yeah, issues to the forefront? In any creative endeavor, it's very difficult to use that word responsibility. Yeah. Okay. And I think the only time it really has traction is if an organization uh, or an artist has made a promise, right? So if I try to get support for my work, I tell a potential donor, this is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. then I am responsible to do that. And I think the same is true. And I have greater expectations of our artistic communities for the promises they have made and some they have not kept, like, you know, promises about diversity. They just have not kept those promises, right? They, they, mm -hmm. And I think that's a responsibility. If you said that, if you got a grant to do that and you didn't do that, then let's look at how you did it. You yeah. know, did you really make the effort that you needed to make to transform the nature of your audience or not, right? So I think about responsibility that way, but I don't think about responsibility in terms of a should. I think it's an opportunity, right? I don't think about my uh, being interested in social justice and putting it in the arts as a, a, a it's not a moral thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a responsibility that I have. It's an opportunity that I have because I feel that these issues are inherently dramatic. And, you know, say the case of gun violence, I think these stories are inherently compelling. And then if we can take something, as I mentioned before, that dark and surround it with beauty, the music, the stage setting, the singers, that we can bring our power to that, then we have an opportunity to bring an issue, which is an, an issue that people may want to distance themselves from to bring it to them as citizens and say, let's do something about it. And, you know, you know, gun violence among gangs in Chicago is just one form of the extraordinary gang violence, uh, gun violence that we're seeing yeah. play out in our country right now. So we do need fora where we can examine that, right? Not yeah. just the news, but the thing about live theater or live dance or live opera is there's all these complete strangers sitting together. Mm. And then they see each other in intermission. And there might be somebody in there who could make a difference or somebody in there who's already doing the work and likes it okay. that, they, that their issue is being recognized. I, I like to think of it that way as the opportunity. And this is kind of a little bit of a follow-up because Katie had sent in ahead of time 
you know, how do you decide the topics of, of your, your work? And, you know, are you constantly looking at what's happening in real life to do that? Because I, I think one of the things that we talk to students about all the time is if you're fortunate enough to be passionate about something and you can use your work, you know, to influence that, it's, it's a great thing, you know, especially if you look at public service or some of these things. But Katie wants to know, how do you even... Do they find you? Do you find them? You know, some of these. Yeah, topics. my my last three projects, um, they found me. My uh, my play about healthcare started because the head of internal medicine at the Yale School of Medicine asked me to come there as a visiting professor to uh, look at uh, doctors and patients and listening to the extent that doctors do or don't listen and to make a performance at medical grand rounds, kind of like the place thing um, idea for the, to mirror these doctors. And so then that ended, I ended up being so interested in um, life and death uh, that I wrote a play, Let Me Down Easy. Um, uh, Notes from the Field started because a philanthropist uh, thought I could use my presence in the theater to bring a, um, attention to the school to prison pipeline. And as I mentioned, Renee Fleming asked me to consider doing an opera about gun violence. So the last three uh, works have been things that, um, you know, people ask me to pay attention to. So, and then it takes really a long time to deliver what I do. It doesn't just happen in a year or anything like that. So it's a real commitment for a period of time because the first thing I have to do is learn about it. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the interesting thing because there is a process where you have to absorb yourself in it. Right. I mean, right. it's different yeah. than saying, here's Hamlet, um, go uh, do a one person show of Hamlet or direct Hamlet. Here's an existing work when you're commissioned, or I'm writing a play about Billie Jean King that will go into um, rehearsal in La Jolla in May. And I don't know anything about tennis. I was the person, <laughs> you know, nobody wanted me on the team. The teacher would have, when they pick people, the teacher, I was always standing there and the teacher would have to make a group take me. <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, it's like, I know nothing about people who are these athletic phenoms, right? <laughs> Uh, so, you know, usually my work takes is I first thing I got to do is learn about what I'm writing about. Well, here's one of my other uh, books that I loved is um, Talk to Me. And that was in, based in mostly 1996. Correct. It's like, but I love this because the premise is that you're going and traveling and having conversations with different, you know, and it's during the 1996, certainly election. But the fascinating thing is, uh, you know, it's it's the subtitles travels in media and politics. What was that like to go and build these conversations and kind of go through? And and the interesting thing is, I think, you know, you said that in one moment you're talking to the president, but in the next moment you're talking to somebody in a woman's prison. Like this was a diverse group that you were talking to. I, and when I think about all the work that we've done and talked about in collaboration and conversations, this is fascinating to me. What did you, you know, what was the premise of this? How did it come about? What did you get out of this piece of work here? Well, the uh, arena stage, which is was before Molly's time, but the theater that she uh, ran, subsequent to the individual who was running it when I, I was there, Doug Wager. First of all, it was a real example of how institutions for what I do are really crucial in um, helping me do the research that I did. And so, uh, but, but, but I'll say one thing great about Washington, uh, which is different than any city I've been in. Mm -hmm. Once they know, well, Harvard is like that if you call Harvard a city, but once yeah. they know you're there, Mm -hmm. They want to meet you, even just to go, she doesn't know what she's talking about, but they want to meet you. They want so, to meet you. <laughs> so I was invited to dinner all over the city in people's homes. Uh, I was invited to a lot of black tie events. <laughs> um, so, and then of course I went on the Clinton and Dole campaigns. Yes. Uh, so um, tell me the, what was the question again about well, that? Well, it's just like, how did you, this, the fascinating thing to me and why I love this book is that you put yourself in situations that you were listening and having these conversations. And I'm, I'm wondering, what did you get, you know, from this? Like, as you're writing this, like, was it, I, not to put rules on it, did you find there's a lot of disparity amongst these different groups? Is there commonality? Oh, like, what was- No, the biggest thing I learned was that the I did 520 interviews to write House Arrest, which was a play that a company talked to me. Biggest thing I learned is that the language of Washington, and this is relevant to the students uh, on, on, this, on this webinar, the language of Washington is what I call the haute couture of language. 
you know. Uh, I'm writing that one down. <laughs> it's the haute couture of language. You know, one of the scholars that I talked to uh, had been a Jefferson scholar, and he said that Thomas Jefferson could never be found in verbal undress. I like that, yeah. I might have evoked that last week when we were doing our work where I wanted to see language breakdown. Yeah. People are very conscious of every word they say, mm -hmm. which in a way made Washington a very difficult place to do the project yeah. because I'm waiting for language to break down. But, you know, the, it, it, it's not it's not going to happen. You know, people are very it's a it's a it's a kind of a courtly language. It's the language of the court. You know, when you look at a classic work like in, in Shakespeare, there's the language of the court. And then there's this other language that happens outside the court. So my biggest learning was, yes, that the people in Washington, whether they're the press, mm -hmm. like to differentiate themselves from those in power, but they too have an enormous amount of power oh, and yeah. they tend to be upper middle class now. Their kids go to the same private schools as in, you know. Yeah. That it's a that inside the beltway is really true. And the extent to which anybody can really reach out and communicate with the rest of America is a success. That that really is what struck me about it. it's they're in their own world. And so I think the question is, and the question for people who are going to be young, uh, you know, be working on the hill uh, or who are going to be in, in diplomatic wars, is how do you keep yourself relevant? to the world while you also have to learn this specific language and behavior. It is interesting because it is a conversation, you know, I, I always said like when I was working at some of these organizations in DC, you know, we really live to work because we have the opportunity to enjoy the work and, and we're passionate about it, but we're doing this for people who work to live. And you can't, you can't, you, you have to keep that perspective and get outside to know that, you know, what their everyday life and what they're thinking and dealing with. And this is why, you know, in some communities, you know, if you don't, if you don't go there, if you don't see it, then you don't understand the strife and the underpinning that's happening when these things, these tragedies. Like people, happen. it's like, you know, we, we go, well, why isn't there anybody in their off, offices anymore? Nobody's going to work. They don't want to. <laughs> she had yeah. me mean like you and I love to work. But yeah. the people who have to work to live are rethinking what work is right now. Right. And I think that's huge in terms of what, what's, what's the labor force going to be or the number of people who, you know, working for Uber, you know, for themselves in Uber or other ways. They don't want to have a boss. Yeah. Yeah, that just the whole definition of, of works change. It's interesting. I'm gonna um I know Ava had a question and but I, I because of time but I wanna be able to ask it for her because one of the things that I when I was reading about you is language, you started really studying language. Language was important to you. You you still, I'm sure it still is, but her question is how do you think different styles of language can be used to create an impact on an audience? As somebody who, you know, you you that means so much to you, how how does it have an impact? Thank you, Ava. I think, um, you know, that that's happening all the time in, in popular culture, right? You know, there, there's a rare uh, movie or television show you're going to see where everybody talks the same. So, yeah. And I'm very interested in, in, in slang. I always have been, I think, because I don't know how good I am at it, but I'll give you an example. I'm working with a jazz musician, Terry Lynn Carrington, who um, <laughs> she used the expression the other day. You know, so, I mean, if you just want to, if like, if you want to be in the hang, I never heard that. I've heard if yeah. you want to hang out. Hang out, yeah. That's what if you want to be in the hang, right? I mean, it's just like this Gram just won the Grammy, you know, this jazz musician. You know, I think it's really interesting. I'm fascinated when people, you know, pop up with these expressions I've never heard before. I like being in the hang. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can say it without feeling silly. Yeah, I think that's interesting too because I have a, I have a niece who's in college, and I think it's also generational. I love when I get together with her when she's home because suddenly there's whole new phrases that you know they're using to communicate that I wasn't even you know aware of. But um, I think that's a lot of the research too that probably goes into these projects is you're you're trying to how do you authentically represent you know? Well, you do it certainly. In my case, you just turn the tape recorder on and they talk how they talk. Yeah. Well, Lisa, and I hate to say this, but I think we're out of time. Okay. Um, I, I do 
so appreciate all the time that you've given us. We're so excited. There's a lot of people signed up tomorrow to hear more from you and, and Molly um, about uh, our very own AU um, alum, Molly Smith, who's a two-time Tony Award winner, theater director and producer. She's actually the artistic director, as you mentioned before, right at Arena Stage here in Washington, DC. We're gonna be in conversation with the two of you. Really, our students really wanna know like questions of career and leadership. And, and I think it's so important because, um, you know, as they're entering this new and diverse workforce, getting, you know, some of your expertise. So that's tomorrow, a virtual conversation at four o'clock. There's still time to register. So if you're on here and you haven't done that yet, please do. Um, for um, all of you who want to learn more about Anna's work and, you know, delve into some of the things she's done, our next newsletter, we'll put a list of some of the works um, and some of the um, books that you can uh, certainly uh, glean from. I've enjoyed, you know, reading them and I look forward to your next projects as well to Anna, because I love this idea of an opera that talks about some, one of the most relevant issues of the day. We were talking about this before we started. So it's even nice to see the evolution and new things that you're taking on, you know, as well. So, um, any last thoughts or words for our participants on today's uh, session? No, just, uh, thank you to you, Amy, for this hospitality today of uh, being in conversation with me. And uh, I hope some of what I said is, is of use to these individuals who I have every bit of faith in without even knowing them all, but I'm just very interested in the, the people that I know are gonna make what's possible tomorrow. Very interested in who they are and feel so privileged to have had the chance to meet some of them and to be talking with them and learn even more about them from the kinds of questions that they ask. Well, it's been an honor to have you here on campus and virtually with us. And I, I know I personally have learned a lot and I was like, I'm attending every session because I want to know and I have this opportunity. And I know for those that took advantage of it, they're appreciative too. And so um, we will get ready for the conversation tomorrow. And um, we look forward to the next time that you can be in DC and we can welcome you back to campus and we'll do a follow-up. Okay, Anna? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, just a reminder, tomorrow, 4 o'clock, still time to register. Just go to the Science Institute website to register, and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you, Anna. Have a good rest of the day. You too. Bye-bye.